I would like to uh, welcome you to the uh, first inaugural A. Richard Newton uh, Global Technology Leaders Conference hosted here at UC Berkeley on this campus and uh, webcast to uh, literally thousands of people around the world as well as uh, viewable on UC TV. Uh, the conference is sponsored by the Kauffman Foundation, which is the world's largest foundation promoting entrepreneurship. I'm Iklak Sidhu. I'm the director of the Center for the Entrepreneurship for Entrepreneurship and Technology at UC Berkeley, and also a professor in the Industrial Engineering and Operations Research Department. Uh, I am one of three co-chairs of this conference, along with my esteemed colleagues, um, our dean uh, Shankar Sastri and uh, Professor Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli. Now. Um, the conference is, of course, named in honor of our uh, dear friend, Richard Newton. Uh, most of us who are here at this round table, and, and many of you in the audience, uh, knew Richard through personal interactions. Um, Richard was a particularly inspiring person um, because he had this um, set of capabilities or qualities which, uh, which is very rare in that he was both a star academic as a, a world famous and, and leading professor in electrical engineering, of course, and, um, and, and a dean. But then also, uh, he had this quality of being a very prolific um, entrepreneur and innovator and executive. Uh, Richard founded no less than six different new technology firms here in uh, Silicon Valley. He was on the board of another eight technology firms, and he was a venture partner in three additional venture firms. And, um, and you know, as we put this conference together, it's, it, it, it's been really our challenge to be able to, to do a good enough job to um, fit or to match uh, his name, because it's, it's um, after him that we're naming this work and, and what we're doing here today. Um, in the three years that I knew Richard, uh, he spoke, you know, him and I, uh, we spoke quite regularly on a, a range of topics, um, starting with uh, the development of the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology, but um, also including uh, how we devise educational programs and curricula that would enable our students to be the next generation of global technology leaders. And of course, that phrase we're borrowing again for, for this conference. Um, one thing that Richard used to say, and this seems to particularly stick in my mind and helped us all in the formation of what it is that we would do with the conference, is that um, at universities, this is his quote really, um, at universities, we don't just have the capability, uh, we don't just build single new ventures uh, or start single firms, but that we really have the capability to start entire industries. And our view at Berkeley has been that the best path to innovation and to industry creation has been to tackle head-on major challenges um, and um, and to approach them with uh, solutions, uh, well, major challenges that, that can be societal challenges and deep, meaningful problems, but that those, if there are solutions to those, um, it can both have a social impact as well as an industry creation impact, and it may very well employ some entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial processes along the way. Um, but there's a range of problems here, and on one end of the spectrum, we've got problems like world hunger. And um, w world hunger is basically a problem that is a wrong way to, to be righted. But this is not a problem that's going to solve itself with market forces. Some sort of intervention is required. And, um, and to that point, I'd like to recognize um, the UC Berkeley, uh, um, uh, the, the, actually the, the Blum Center for Poverty Alleviation and the work that goes on there. Um, but my point is that, you know, that's one end of the spectrum. And, and again, those are, are problems that just don't solve themselves. The market cannot fix it by itself. On the other end of the spectrum are problems like searching the vastness of the internet. And here, um, some technical understanding, 
um, some uh, uh, amounts of capital, um, you know, a, a solution that, that has a couple of these components plus the market forces by itself creates an industry. And of course, we're well aware of companies that have been um, spawned be, be, through solving that problem. Um, but the problems that we're going to talk about today, in fact, most of these big problems, they lie somewhere in this continuum between the, the deep societal problem, which requires the heavy enabler, and the, um, a, and the problem which, if you just have a solution, the market forces take care of themselves. And um, the degree of the enabler is something that we have to think about with all of the topics that, that we're going to be bringing up today, because they all lie. Uh, on this continuum between, on one extreme, arbitrage, and the other extreme, social challenge. That is where, where the opportunity lies. Um, technology, policy, education, restructuring, the, these are often part of the solutions. Today we're going to talk about three problems, three of these social challenges that are in the energy and technology space, and then three additional breakthroughs that are in the health and quality of life space. And um, with all of these, uh, with this esteemed panel, um, the, the things that we hope will come out in the discussion are, you know, which are the right problems that really can lead to new industry? What are these enablers? What's the reasonable time scale? And can we identify some successes that we think this path would actually lead to both the social benefit and the um, industry creation? Um, fortunately, we have um, an incredible amount of brain power here at the table to help us sort through these issues. Um, before introducing the panel and, and starting, we have some opening remarks. First from my um, co-chair, Dean Shankar Sastry, who's going to address um, th the fact that this, what we discuss here is not only for the benefit of people outside of Berkeley, but it's for our own benefit too. And what are the things that we're doing or how will we use this information? So if you please. Dean Shankar Sastry. Good morning. Uh, you know, I'm really pleased to welcome you to the first Richard Newton Global Technology Leaders Conference. And, and before I start, I'd like to recognize the vision of uh, Carl Schramm and Lisa Mitchell, who uh, really worked at this for a few months. And I'm really delighted to see it be a reality here. And, uh, you know, it's in the middle of Entrepreneur's Week, and that was uh, part of why we chose it here to be uh, during this week. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, introduce Lisa at the end of my uh, remarks. Uh, Iklak asked me to talk about sort of the uh, College of Engineering and the Berkeley stake, more generally the Berkeley stake, uh, even more generally perhaps the UC stake here in what's going to happen in this conference. Uh, when I took over the deanship about last uh, July, we had a uh, faculty retreat. You, you know, usually when deans call uh, faculty to these retreats, uh, you know, a handful of faculty show up out of loyalty. But I was uh, quite heartened that uh, three-fourths of our faculty, roughly 200 of the 260, showed up. And there was really a clear sense that the college would like to work on big problems, and big problems with social, economic, entrepreneurial uh, issues in addition to sort of uh, technology invention. And that broadly is entrepreneurship and innovation. And the three areas that uh, the faculty wanted to work in is information technology in the interest of society, big problems in energy and the environment, and to nobody's surprise, engineering better healthcare. So uh, the first of these agenda items, so the last two of course, are the titles of the two sessions that you have. There's a rich tradition in Berkeley of taking the outputs of groups such as this and actually converting this into sort of more tactical plans to execute the vision that we hope you'll provide today. So we take these things pretty seriously and we take advisory groups pretty seriously. Citrus, the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society, is an exemplar of an institute that we created at Berkeley based on feedback from sessions like this in the sort of the heyday of the information technology boom and revolution. You know, people said, pay attention to what it'll do to change societal scale systems. And in response to that, we really created Citrus. And the title says, Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society. I'm pleased to say, you know, that's very much off and running. It has strategic content. 
And as Iklak mentioned, some of the big spin-offs in it have been, uh, ha an example has been this Blum Center for Developing Economies, uh, which Iklak uh, pledged for a second. Uh, we had Arun Sareen speaking last night uh, to us, and one thing that Arun said, which was pretty interesting, especially for the agenda of both Citrus and the Blum Center, is that the needs of the developing world really need the best of tomorrow's technologies rather than hand-me-down technologies. And when you go and develop them, they actually boomerang back into the developed world and provide for novel and wonderful solutions. That was certainly his experience, and that was sort of his strategic plan at Vodafone. And it certainly paid huge dividend for him because he said if he hadn't reached out into the developing world, India, China, and Africa, you know, the Vodafone growth would not have been anywhere close to what he was able to do. So I think, so where I'm going with all of this is that during the course of what we do at Berkeley from the advice that you give us, you know, we are really able to send uh, the work, the business of integrating uh, invention into innovation into pretty novel and interesting directions. So for us, an event like this is really fantastically important. And I'd like to thank every one of our panelists and participants for coming here to provide us this advice. I promise you we'll value it and, uh, and sort of do good with it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think my job is to not occupy too much of your time and get to the sessions. I'd like to uh, recognize Lisa Mitchell, the Vice President of the Kaufman Foundation. Uh, and she will speak briefly about certainly our Berkeley contributions and a little bit about the Kaufman Foundations. So welcome, Lisa. Five years ago, I was invited to a meeting at um, Half Moon Bay, Ritz-Carlton. And the topic of the session was um, university industry collaborations. It was hosted by the Bay Area Science and Innovation Consortium, of which Reg is now the chair. And um, there, the reason for the meeting is there was a presumption on behalf of many people in industry that they were seeing a breakage of uh, breakdown of this role between university and industry. And I sat down next to a big burly guy from Australia. And, um, and didn't know Rich until that moment, and he got up and spoke. And as most of you know, Rich is very passionate. And um, we ended up in heated discussions, which was great. And it became a essentially five-year relationship between the Kauffman Foundation and Rich Newton. Um, what that meant to us was really understanding what is the role of university scientists in our economy, we literally created a um, project, a research project that's housed now down at UCLA um, called Rockstar Scientists. Um, it, it really helped us to understand the importance of university science, innovation, and how that fosters entrepreneurship and new business. And so when we approached, um, I think we had a meeting about a year ago down at Stanford Park Hotel. Um, with Shankar and some others and said, how do we catalyze? Um, this was part Alberta's idea and Carl Schramm's idea. How do we catalyze the lessons from Rich Newton into something that will carry on for the future? And um, how do we make sure that we get that information outside of just um, the great minds of Berkeley and their football friends at Stanford? Um, <laughs> Tom's looking down, I see. Um, <laughs> and how do we make sure that that information, um, and literally the thought relative to the fusion of innovation and entrepreneurship get out to the rest of the world? So I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, I think people came from far away. Uh, I know Alberto came in from Italy. Frank flew in from Taiwan. Um, I hosted a session in Brazil for Global Entrepreneurship Week two days ago. Uh, so there's many jet lag people here. Uh, but, I'm, but I'm hoping that the energy in the room and the passion that we all feel relative to the legacy of Rich Newton will keep us awake um, and energize throughout the day. As Shankar said, this is, is Global Entrepreneurship Week. For those of you who haven't noticed, 
We have, um, this is the first time that the foundation has hosted Global Entrepreneurship Week. We have 75 countries involved, more than 2,000 events going on around the world. Um, and this is our signature event focused on the area of innovation and entrepreneurship and the contribution of innovation to um, um, hopefully economic growth. I think, um, obviously, we've been planning Global Entrepreneurship Week for quite a long time. Um, our fiscal crisis has helped energize <laughs> the um, focus on entrepreneurship and the need for um, the importance of being able to translate our, our monies that we provide into research, into the commercial marketplace, and, and uh, catalyze economic growth. So thank all of you for being here. We really appreciate it and um, hope that we have a wonderful, insightful day today. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Believe it or not, we're right on time. In fact, we might even be early. Um, th there's just a, uh, um, a couple small things that we need to do. Actually, not so small things. I, I have to um, tell you, first of all, about this very important piece of paper in front of you, uh, particularly for the panelists. Um, what this is, is a way for you to give us feedback on what you're going to hear. And it's not that we're going to take this feedback and file it away or um, casually read it. Um, instead, we're, we're going to take this feedback and um, very particularly use the metrics that you give us and build a global technology re leaders roadmap today. From the numbers that you place uh, in these boxes, we're going to be able to construct um, some pictorial representation of wh what you think of the things that you've heard today, particularly when they would happen how much societal impact we think that they would have, and um, how much market impact you think that these things can cause. So your first job, besides speaking as panelists, is to actually provide this feedback um, immediately um, a, 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 during the presentation. Now, the, uh, before introducing our um, moderator for the first session, I think we need to introduce the actual round table. So um, I'm going to start on this side and, and basically come around. Um, uh, our um, round table today consists of uh, Shai Agassi from Better Place, Ray Bingham from General Atlantic, Eva Bolsons of Xilinx, Tom Byers, Stanford uh, University, Paul Camuti from um, Siemens Corporation, uh, Molly Coy from Health Tech Center, Jim Davidson of Silver Lake, um, uh, Frank Douglas from the Kauffman Foundation, Jay Kiesling from UC Berkeley, Reg Kelly, ah, there we go. <laughs> That's not Reg Kelly. <laughs> okay, from uh, QB3 and, and UC Berkeley. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, Bob Knight, UC Berkeley, Arun Majumdar, uh, UC Berkeley, Michael Marks, formerly Flextronics and now Big Wood Capital, uh, Jean Rabai, uh, UC Berkeley and particularly a Wireless Research Center, um, Professor San Giovanni, UC Berkeley, J.B. Straubel, uh, Tesla. Did I? Oh, I'm sorry. I, you know what? Um, I didn't realize that you could be here so quick. <laughs> Tom Siebel <laughs> of Siebel Systems previously and, and uh, well-recognized brand name on, on own. Um, uh, where was I? Uh, J.B. Straubel of uh, Tesla and uh, Dr. Irv Weisman of Stanford. All right. So um, I'd like to invite our first moderator to um, come up. And that will be uh, Todd Woody, senior editor of Fortune magazine, uh, to lead the energy and um, technology session. Good morning. We seem to be on the cusp of a major shift brought on by the recent elections, the financial crisis, the apparent collapse of the auto industry, and growing concerns over global warming and energy independence. Today we're going to talk about three technologies that could represent a paradigm shift 
And their success will depend not just on innovative business models, but I think increasingly on policy, public policy considerations, which I think will be a focus of our discussion today. Um, first off, Shai Agassi from Better Place. We'll talk for about 15 minutes, we'll have 10 minutes of discussion, and then our next speaker, then our third speaker. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for this great opportunity and, uh, and for hosting us here. Um, I'd like to start with a study that was actually published from a different university, from MIT. It was actually quoted uh, recently about the electric car market. We're a uh, better place, for those who don't know, uh, are the first electric recharge grid operator in the world. If you want to think of, uh, of the electric car as a cell phone, we're AT&T. Um, I know AT&T got a study once that uh, there will only be 900,000 cell phones in the world and decided to leave that market. But today when you look at operators in, in this market, we, if we were in Europe, we would be Vodacar right now. Uh, the study actually says that uh, by 2016, the end of the, the new coming administration, we will have 10 million electric cars on the road around the world. And uh, that's the most optimistic and pessimistic number I've ever heard in my life. It's optimistic on the one hand because uh, if in 2011 we will have 100,000 electric cars on the road, that would be a great start and by all means it will be a, a significant number. So uh, as, as Michael will tell you, to scale an industry, the, the type of electric cars from 100,000 cars in 2011 to, to about 10 million by 2016, 100x fold in, uh, in scaling on an industry that's not made of bits, it's not Google, it's not Microsoft, but it would be an industry of the size of two Microsofts grown in five years would be an unheard of challenge as far as supply chains, as far as uh, of, of an industry. Uh, to put it in, in perspective, for us, for the operators, um, a 10 million car market at give or take about four or $5,000 average cost of energy transfer transportation, which is what you'd pay for the average car to drive in, in Europe today a year, would mean about a $50 billion market materializing in five years. Um, so you'd grow, you know, sort of two, three Googles in, in five years, very significant number. But let's assume that number happens and look at the implications of that on the market as we see in the automotive market today. We're adding about 70 million cars on the road every year. Maybe this year will be tough. We'll add only 60 million. Um, between now and 2016, we're going to add 500 million cars to our roads. Um, with the most optimistic planning, only 40% of them uh, will be replacements. So we'll, we're looking at 60 million cars, most of, most of them coming in, in the brick plus six in the 10 developing countries around the world. And in China, when somebody buys a car, it's not only their first car, it's their first driving experience most of the time. Don't drive on Chinese roads um, when people buy a lot of cars. So um, what you're looking at is, is a market of about a billion cars. It's, it's an addition of roughly 40% barrels of oil every morning to drive these cars. And unless Jay here scales at a factor of about, what, about a million X, uh, from 20 barrels a day to 20 million barrels a day, uh, we're going to be short of oil. Now, you don't navigate the price of oil based on the choppiness that you see in the market every morning. You navigate that with a view into the horizon, and that's an eight-year view. Uh, we're going to be looking at prices that may actually be in the $200 or $300 a barrel. Now, what we'll see is a very interesting oscillating curve around a, a parabolic increase of a baseline. The, the oscillations will correlate very nicely with a decrease in buying of cars, decrease of ability to pay mortgages, the, the stoppage of a global economy. Unfortunately, that oscillation doesn't lead to anything good unless we are able to separate between cars and oil. And so that's the world we're facing. In other words, if we don't get to about 100 million cars on the road by 2016, we're looking at a series of economic meltdowns, one after the other between now and then. Um, not a pleasant view, which means we need to grow an industry about 1,000x, not 100x, in electric cars. That's the macro picture we're starting from. from and um, To grow that industry 1,000x, we can only do it um, with massive policy, massive guidance, 
um, as you said, not necessarily just pure market forces. It's an industry that has a three to five year uh, planning horizon. So when you design a car, it takes you today three to five years on a normal um, horizon to get that car into market, into mass market. It's an industry that doesn't have an infrastructure to support it. Imagine we put out a new car driven by synthetic oils that would require a whole new set of infrastructure to distribute that synthetic oil. That car wouldn't even be bought. We wouldn't have a way to distribute that energy into the car. When you go to electric, we don't have the last foot. You see, we have a beautiful grid built about 100 change years ago to get electrons into every home to get away from oil as a lighting mechanism. That's how we got electrons on, onto the grid, but we have not connected that grid into the parking lot. And unless you're in parts of Canada or parts of Scandinavia, there is no spot to connect your car when you get to park it. Yet, it's the perfect appliance. It's a car that goes on electrons, that's parked 22 hours a day, that's willing to take any type of electricity, especially renewables, especially at night. It's the perfect match for wind. It's the perfect match for saving our grid. And so we have now a problem that has got multiple different facets. And it has the most interesting economics. I went and I visited with JB about a year and a half ago, two years ago, in their facility over at Tesla. And I wrote a piece of information on my notebook on that day. Battery is a consumable, not part of the car. If you separate between the battery ownership and the car ownership, and you look just as a battery, think of it as the electric equivalence of crude oil, and you think about it as a sort of a book of drives that coupons come off every time you charge and discharge that battery, the cost of the battery on a per mile basis is somewhere between four and six cents per mile. Cost of clean electrons per mile is somewhere between a cent and two cents. And it has a beautiful trend line. It trends down towards about two to three cents in the aggregate of the two. We can get a two, three cent mile in about six, seven, eight years time. That's the equivalent in today's unfortunate mix of uh, efficiency in the US of about 25 miles per gallon, the equivalent of about 75 cent gallon. And if you're waiting for 75 cent gallon, don't hold your breath. It's not coming back to the US. Now, if we have that economics and we apply that as a CO2 abatement cost, we actually have the cheapest CO2 abatement cost in the world for the largest CO2 bulk that we can attack. We have 22% of the CO2 emissions in the world are actually coming out of cars in the, in the billion tailpipes. To be able to stop that at a price of about minus 200 to minus $300 per ton of CO2, in other words, a positive abatement cost for the economy would provide tremendous savings on the global economy. So we have a solution for CO2 emissions, for an ailing car industry, for our global economy, and for climate change that requires a coordinated effort. It, it requires a framework, a systems framework, not just innovation, not just invention. It requires what we all know in the Bay Area as the magic combination of a technology shift plus a new business model. On the 100th anniversary of the Ford Model T, it's time for Car 2.0. And as CAR 2.0 shows up, it needs the innovation of the Bay Area, and it needs the power, the manufacturing power, the scale of a supply chain of Detroit, Michigan, and it needs the guidance and policy and leadership equivalent to a Manhattan Project or an Apollo Project of Washington, D.C. We put it all together. We have a whole new industry of a scale of $10 trillion scale of the car industry and the energy industry put together. But it won't happen if we don't put all the brains together, if we don't apply everything that we all learned as we went from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0, as we went from Phone 1.0 to Phone 2.0, as we're going from Car 1.0 to Car 2.0. So I welcome the opportunity of getting so many brains and so much brain power coordinated through such a wonderful institute. And I thank you for the invitation. Um, I apologize for not being able to stay the entire day. We have a, a host in San Francisco City Hall today that um, is not graceful if you're not coming over. 
on time. So at some point, I will have to leave. I'm glad that you were able to join us early today. Thank you all. I just want to throw this up open for discussion. One question is, how can we speed up this process? It seems like the electric car has been forever in coming. Shai is going to build the infrastructure. JV is going to provide some cars. What do we need to do to get this going? And another question I'm going to throw out there is, you got the infrastructure, you got the cars. What about the batteries? How are we going to build a battery industry in this country? Because currently, right now, we'd be replacing one form of dependence with another. We don't make batteries in the US, despite some small startups. So what do you guys think? Well, I can take a, a shot at the battery uh, question there. Um, it's definitely right. You know, right now there's no manufacturing of batteries, the actual cells that go into these cars um, in the U.S. at all. And uh, Japan and uh, Taiwan, China, Korea are really the, the global leaders there. But it is a little bit different than a, the crude oil dependence. There's, there's a common synergy drawn between you know, importing crude oil and importing cells and batteries. Um, but, but batteries are really manufacturing a, a component out of raw materials. It's a relatively low, low margin business. You're not pulling something out of the ground and then shipping it off with a you know, thousand percent markup. Um, so that's something that's tricky. You know, the battery industry right now has very low returns and it's something that you know, large companies in the US like GE or people that could really apply some, some horsepower to this are a little bit reluctant to dive into and invest huge capital into. So I think that almost turns back into a, a bit of a policy question uh, because that's one reason that Japan has been so influential in, in batteries and the energy industry surrounding that is that it's a very, um, uh, very uh, friendly uh, environment there um, and it's something that the, the Japanese uh, government really feels is, is a, a core product that they want to con control and uh, invest in. So unless the U.S. really takes a position where this becomes something that we sort of view as a national treasure that we're willing to invest in and, and uh, uh, grab hold of, it'll be very hard to, to move that manufacturing here um, just on the merits of the financial benefits to the companies. So the, the trend in the battery industry is that um, it doubles its capacity on an average in 60 years. So talk about a Moore's law that we are not proud of. So um, I think there seems, you know, there, there certainly seems to be a need for some innovation, both on the science and engineering and technology development, or how to accelerate the capacity while making it cost effective and safe. And uh, I think that that's a major need in this country. Just to uh, inject a note of, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> wait for you to write. But to in inject a note of optimism, I, I, I do think sort of the number of recharge cycles, I if not the capacity of the batteries, sort of the number of recharge cycles, which is, I, I don't know if Shai factored that in his uh, two cents. You did factor it. Okay, I'll turn it over to you. But, but you know, I do see some, uh, even though this 60-year uh, doubling is pretty a pretty bad record, I think there's been real progress in terms of even getting lithium-ion batteries to have, uh, to move up from uh, hundreds and several hundreds of recharge cycles to the thousands. And maybe some of that innovation will help bring some of that lithium-ion technology back to the U.S. And so, uh, and of course, there are all these exotic materials that you hear about in LBL, you know, samariums and cobalts and all parts of the periodic table that I learned in my infancy only. So m maybe I, I don't feel as pessimistic about the state of battery technology here. Yeah, this, let, me, let me just correct one, one number. We, we actually do have a 20-year trend line that is about an 8 to 10 percent annual improvement. Uh, right now, which means we're on a Moore's law curve. We're on we're a five-year more, not not an 18-month more as we have in the silicon industry, but on 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 energy density at least. We're on a five-year more um, on uh, kilowatt-hour cycles. We're even improving significantly faster. So if you look at the new technologies, we're of, of safe lithium. We're at about 1,500, 2,000, in some cases about 5,000 cycles, um, and and the mile cost is a kilowatt-hour cycle cost. And so the trend line is, is actually uh, much more optimistic. At the same time, what JB said is, is absolutely correct. If I'm looking at a battery, if I'm a battery manufacturer today, um, I want to take my development to China.
because policy-wise, um, as far as permitting, I have the shortest lead time to put a factory and scale it, replicate it, as much as I want. And if I manufacture batteries, I want to take them to Europe because I'm replacing gasoline, which because of its taxation in Europe, I get much more for the battery. And at no point in time do I go through the US. So if you, if you push policy apart for a second, if you do nothing in the US, no battery will be made in the US, nor will it be consumed in the US. Now, I can guarantee you between now and 2010, China will decide that it goes electric on cars, which means somebody will put a law in China that says everybody else in the world who wants an electric car battery needs to stand in line behind China. We're going to be very, very far behind on that line. Let me ask this. Industrial policy has been out of favor in this country for at least the last couple of decades. It's sort of been a dirty word in Silicon Valley. Do we need to rethink this? Is it time for a new industrial policy for batteries and other renewable energies? So, so no doubt we have, the, we have the choice between applying policy to taxation or applying choice to technology. We, Russia this, this week reduced its oil export tax to $25 a barrel with the preconditions that the manufacturers need to continue to drill and, and uh, produce the same amount. Now, even at $25 a barrel, every producer is losing about $15 a barrel when they take it out of Russia. So it used to be 35, it went down to 25, but they've applied a policy that we're not willing to apply when we import their oil of taxation on oil. So since we've decided not to touch taxation on oil, we're taxing at less than one cent a mile right now. We have to apply another policy, which means if you make a battery in the US, we'll give you some loan guarantee to make it, but then you have to keep it in the US. So we have to create a disadvantage for the manufacturers by creating an advantage to produce first in the US. If we don't do either, batteries will not come here. That's, that, that's pure, clear economics. So if capitalism prevails with zero taxation, which is the only policy that really works, we won't have batteries in the US. We'll have a small amount, but not, not enough to drive the country. Uh, just a general question, just a general comment on, on policy. Uh, it's an issue of need. And when we see the three CEOs of the car companies with the uh, hat in hand in front of the Congress, uh, and uh, we recognize that as a matter of fact, uh, depending on the decision made, this uh, uh, industry could sort of disappear. It is a compelling reason for policy change. And I think that's where the answer is. You couldn't have a, uh, a better argument uh, for a policy change than the one that we presently have. Anyone else? Yeah, a, um, a comment. I, I'm actually mic'd, so I, I actually don't need that. Um, which is, uh, Shai made an interesting point about the six-year window. Bef you know, once you decide that, that you want to make an electric vehicle, the design cycle and, and all the, the buildup is so long that it takes six years before you can actually do it. I'm wondering, is, um, is that cycle shorter on, on the battery? Because the, the question is, is a battery something that you can catch up with, or is it that if you miss this one also, um, you'll never be able to get back? So it's, the view on batteries is there's always the magic battery that comes around the corner. Unfortunately, that was the best reason not to buy an electric car because everybody in the car industry told you that five years from now there's going to be a better battery and you didn't want to be the one stuck with the old battery, which is part of why we separated between car and battery. The current batteries are good enough. Okay? It's, it, they've got great octane to, to, mm -hmm. to sort of equate it. They've got a great price performance, um, better than what we have with gasoline. So we should start with what we got today. The problem is permitting to manufacturing of a factory right now in the US will probably take somewhere around 30 months. In China, it will take about 12 to 18 months. And so if, if you have an industry that scales at this kind of a curve, at a 10x, 100x, 1000x curve, you go to the place where you can scale as fast as possible, seeing the indicators with, with the shortest lead time. What we need to do in, in, in the US is to acknowledge that this is a national security issue. It's a national economic security issue. And come in and say, we're going to do something for that. And we'll take the risk, just go build the factories. Because it's a lower risk to hold a few, fa a few battery factories not producing 
than to get stuck again with $147 a barrel with no answer. Yeah, I think the, um, you know, the question of policy is a good one because I said earlier that the, um, the challenge is a systems challenge, right? I mean, if, the, if you solve the battery problem and you have a thousand X increase in electric vehicles, we're quickly going to run into the grid, the power generation um, in, a, in a renewable or sustainable way. And so the, the overall uptake of electrical vehicles is, is kind of an end-to-end -end problem that, that probably won't work itself out incrementally over a shorter period of time. So, I mean, there has to be a way to kind of create that ecosystem that'll, that'll push the whole system together. So, so just to just address that point, and I missed it in my, in my points, um, generation has to come hand in hand. Clean generation has to come hand in hand in, in a broader um, system design. For example, in Israel, when we come on board, we're adding, for every car that we put into our grid, we put one kilowatt of solar generation, which if you look at it over a period of about 10 years, which is what we plan to convert an entire country, would mean about two gigawatts of solar generation. It's, it's interesting because the size of, of the reflectors or PV, depending on the technology you choose, is the size of a car. So you put a car and you park a, a photovoltaic cell in the desert the same size. The beauty is you can send it from the desert very easily on, onto the, on the existing grid. Uh, the same thing happens in, in Denmark. We're using the same uh, ratio with windmills, so wind generation at night. The, the other element we have to take into consideration is the grid and generation we have today is sufficient if we're willing to accept um, a, an interim period of generation that is not only renewable. So DOE's numbers are that the U.S. can convert 86% of the cars to electric without a single additional generation source and without any change to the grid. This is DOE's number which have not been favorable to electric vehicles historically. So um, we could go to electric without any change, but doing it hand in hand with renewable generation would create effectively a, a virtual oil field for this country forever. So throw something else out there. Today Ford's trading around a dollar or something to share. Henry Waxman replaced John Dingell on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. What are these uh, confluence of events what kind of opportunities do these present for your company, for Tesla, and for electric cars? So I have a question, I guess, about the business model. Um, in that, you know, we don't start with a clean slate, and we also have a history of the government being involved in certain things and not other things. And so I have a couple of questions, which is, I understand the battery industry probably uh, really works well with a competitive environment, maybe some government incentives. The car industry probably works well, although it's hard to throw the existing structure out when there's three to six million jobs, et cetera. So an, an adaptation probably makes sense with some restructuring incentives. I, I'm not sure, Shai, I understand. The grid, though, however, probably lends itself not to a competitive environment, but to a natural monopoly. And historic, I mean, to overbuild it, to provide um, access to the electrons at multiple nodes, strikes me as you should do it once, you should do it well, but the government historically has not um, allowed the private sector to attack a natural monopoly and reap monopolistic profits at three times the size of Microsoft or ten times the size of Google. And so the last thing is, I guess, what's the, what's the capital investment to get to break even because the capital markets historically have not financed something that takes hundreds of millions and billions of dollars to get to critical mass. And so is this really a private sector solution or is this really a government partnership solution where the taxpayers make the investment, you know, a WPA-like program for the 21st century car 2.0? And, um, and how does your company play into that? Because I guess I'm struggling with a business model that strikes me as a natural monopoly and the government historically has, has done that itself. Right. So, so when we started about two years ago, uh, we were the only crazy guys who said it can be done. And so when I went to the uh, Prime Minister of Israel, which was our first site, um, his answer when I said, we need $200 million to go build the grid for enough ubiquity in Israel, he said, you, you must be confusing me with a venture capitalist because I don't give money to crazy ideas. Go find your $200 million. If you do and you find a car maker, I'll give you a country that will let you install your network and spend the money here as long as it's a lot of labor. So 
the, the natural tendency of governments is to not lead but allow people to come in and put the, the grid into the, into the ground. If you think of, take it back 100 years, we, you know, if we had today's permits, we wouldn't get the electric grid because Westinghouse and Edison would probably give up at some point. Um, and so what we've actually come up is a model in which we put the grid in, but we give up our monopolistic rights, if you want, on day one. We, we create an open network on day one. And we ask for the regulator to force us effectively into sort of an open source, open access me method. Why? Because we believe that you don't battle a monopoly with a monopoly. You, the, the best way to battle a monopoly is to get as many players as possible to come in and co-build this kind of a network. The only thing we're asking government to do is to force anybody who comes in to use the same standards. Otherwise, we'd get different nozzles at, at, at every gas station. And so we said, make sure everybody uses whatever the standard is by whatever committee, international committee you choose, so that all cars can plug into the same network. Make sure we use the same protocol so we can all identify the cars the same way. And if we have competition, there are 10 players in it, so be it. It's a big enough market to have as many players as possible. And the fact that we were first, or the first crazy guys to run with it, means we'll have brand recognition. That's the only thing we can fight on. Now, I, I know if, if I went and asked for money, you'd say, hey, you know, you could make more profit if, if you try and lock it and be a monopoly. And, but it's not just about profit. It's about saving a planet. And so part of it is we, we're trying to save our kids at the same time. So we're looking at it from a perspective of opening the market, creating competition, knowing that there is an industry to be saved. So knowing that we have three million workers, but as you go through the transition, if there is a big network, if there's competition, if prices continue to, to, to come down, we save most of these workers. We create a fast enough uptake on, on the new cars that 80, 90% of these workers will be already working on electric cars as 10, 20% are retooled for a new drivetrain. All this has to happen in some coordination, so the government needs to come up and say, here is how we open the market be it through auctions as they did in, in phone bandwidth, be it through state-by-state uh, state regulation, or be it at federal level by, uh, by putting in edicts or, or coordinated efforts, as, as some governments will do. Um, but we're, we're effect the, the one thing we've said from day one, don't make it a monopoly, make it open. Um. I think I would like to argue a little bit about some of the models that have been used here uh, in terms of timeline and how we basically deploy this thing. We basically keep on extrapolating how many cars are going to be out there, the growth of the automotive industry, and so on and so forth. But as you already mentioned, the, basically the growth, basically maintaining that growth is going to be very hard. You have to build out the grid, you have to get to solve a whole bunch of uh, technical problems. Uh, I think it's unavoidable that the cost of transportation is going to keep on going up. And that's to me, is going to change fundamentally the way we think about commuting. Uh, and I think we have to take that into account, that if you look at timelines, those eight years to me seem to be unreasonable. Uh, the timeline's gonna be longer. And as a result of that, we might see some fundamental shifts as a result of maybe you're gonna think about different way of communication and commuting as a result of that. So I think uh, just extrapolation is a very dangerous thing to do in this space. Well, I find this, <clears throat> find this conversation a little bit peculiar in the sense that there's n there hasn't been any mention of the consumer here. I mean, to, to talk about where to build battery factories, I don't really get that personally. I mean, if, there's, <clears throat> if we're going to have 100 million cars and everyone's going to use 5,000 batteries or whatever, the, 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 I mean, that's where, that's where business people jump into the market. They'll build factories to build, to build batteries. The problem right now is, you know, to have a reasonable electric car costs six or seven or eighty thousand dollars, and you can buy a gas-driven car for twelve thousand dollars. It gets forty miles to a gallon. And so, if we're going to talk about creating the industry, we have to talk about creating consumer demand. I mean, you know, the we had a good spectacle this week with all the with all the uh, the, <clears throat> the car company CEOs up there, and about you know what a mess they you know they've made of the industry. But you know, they were building what people were buying, which was big trucks and SUVs three or four years ago. And we have to actually, if we're gonna solve this problem, have to be talking about creating the kind of products that the economics that consumers will want. And if they do that, then a lot of this other stuff will naturally follow. The, the supply chains will get built out, the grids will get built out, because there'll be a reason to invest in all that stuff. Instead of talking about doing that from a policy standpoint and then hoping that consumers are gonna go out and buy these things. So, so I'm, uh, 
part of the problem of jumping into the middle of a, of, of a presentation, trying to do a, an hour presentation in about 15 minutes. We, we, uh, we didn't start by building a car. We started by making the same decision that unless you get to a contract with the consumer that gives them a car that is more convenient than what they're driving today at a more affordable price, this is never going to happen. You're absolutely 100% right. Our partner in, in crime, if you want, is Carlos Ghosn, the CEO of the two, one, you know, two large um, car companies. And when Renault and Nissan decided to go build electric cars in mass, they started from the same contract. We need to be with an electric car that costs to the consumer $20,000 or less. And that's what they're building. They're building a, uh, a massive uh, program, a billion dollar program, to get a sedan or an SUV at $20,000 base price before rebates, before what we do in, in our business model. Um, and it's a five seat car, fast acceleration, zero to 60 at sub 10 seconds with uh, freeway speeds, with half as many parts in the car to make, which makes it a lot easier to scale, a lot easier to, to bring to, to a lower price, with a lot lower cost of maintenance, which reduces the warranty cost for them, with desirability. And desirability means I, I need to have a car, once, once you have the kind of infrastructure we're putting in place, that stops less times than once a week to fill up. Right? So we're, we, we're looking at a model that you, you stop for the exchange of battery, if you want, 20 times a year. Now, take an affordable car, five seats, you own at $20,000 or less, with less cost to operate every week, you, you, have, a, you have a very scalable consumer side model. Now. It, it can be done not just by a French company or a Japanese company. It can also be done by a U.S. maker. We just need to get them focused on the new desirability model. It's not, a, it's not an F-150. Okay? It's, it's hopefully a Model E. All I'll say is if you, if, if you get $20,000 cars like that, everybody wants to buy, the, the, the battery factories will get built. Yeah. I don't think that's going to be your biggest problem. True. Thank you. We're going to have to move on to our next speaker, Aruma Jamdar, who's going to talk about thermoelectrics and energy efficiency, or efficient energy. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk at this event. Um, I'm going to give a little more scientific uh, talk. I'm a professor. That's what I do. and. Um, We'll talk about, as I want to draw you in into an area which is often untouched, and uh, many of us believe there's a huge opportunity out here. So let me walk you through some slides. Um, if you look at heat, um, most of the energy that is used today, primary energy, is converted to heat first. And um, whether it's power generation, um, if you look at the amount of heat that is wasted, it's about 50 to 60 percent of the heat, uh, of the energy is wasted as heat at temperatures which are often 200, 300 degrees Celsius. Okay? In manufacturing, which are the big manufacturing, steel, cement, glass, aluminum, paper, um, 60 percent of the energy goes as heat at temperatures much higher than 100 degrees Celsius. It's huge. Um, if you, in transportation, um, you, if you have an engine, 60 percent of the energy of the chemical fuel is wasted as heat. And if you now put that all together of the US, the spaghetti chart, if you haven't seen, seen the spaghetti chart, here it is. On the left-hand side is the supply side of energy. And in the United States, the total amount of energy that the United States uses is approximately 100 quads. One quad is one quadrillion BTU, or one exajoule. And if you look at the numbers, it is absolutely striking down below, you have you know, coal, natural gas, petroleum, uh, which is the majority. And on the top are the renewables. And solar, for example, is 0 0.006 quads. This is about a few years ago. And of course, we have to grow that. So if you, and then on the right-hand side is the demand side of energy. And roughly one-third of the energy goes into buildings, one-third in manufacturing, like steel, cement, et cetera, and the last third goes to transportation. So if you look at the game that we have to play or the, the technology that we have to develop uh, to address energy and climate change, you have to do two things. 
you can't just do one thing. You got to reduce the demand, okay? And you got to increase the renewable part of the supply. Otherwise, we'll be filling that demand with fossil fuels. So that's the, the, the real challenge, and you have to do it cost effectively with policies, innovation, technologies, all working together. There's a big chunk out there that is no one quite addresses is about 55 to 60 quads is wasted. Of the 100 quads, about 60 goes into waste. And of course, part of it is, is what is required by the laws of physics. Okay, you have to dump some of the heat. But it does not require, the laws of physics does not require to dump some of the heat at 500 degrees Celsius. And that is where the opportunity lies. So I just want to draw you into that. And so here it is. That's the waste heat that we're talking about. And the question is, can we convert part of that, 10% of that, less than 10% into electricity and put it back? Okay? If you do that, the numbers are that at five cents a kilowatt hour, okay, which is cheaper than what it is today in California, it's about $70 billion per year. Okay, that's just the United States. Forget about the rest of the world. So that's the opportunity that we're talking about and it's really taking what we have today and making it more efficient. And energy efficiency is really the lowest hanging fruit today. So how come no one has done this? I mean, this is obvious. The problem is that how we do that conversion is not quite easy. So this is the, on the supply side going to waste. If you look at now buildings, which is 40%, not just one third, is the biggest chunk of energy. 72% of the electricity goes into that. Um, and it's about 10% you know, of the US GDP. About 40 to 60% of the load in buildings is heating and cooling, all right? And you know, it's sort of dirty. It's, it's not sexy photovoltaics or anything, but that's where the energy goes. So if you put all that together and ask the question, can we do something? And there is a technology which is very old, but it is extremely inefficient, and that's the challenge that we are looking at. It is the area of using semiconductors for converting heat into electricity or converting electricity into the right kind of heat, either heat pumping or, or air conditioning refrigeration. And the materials that are used today are just, you know, these are semiconductors, and the first thing that people think of in semiconductors is silicon. But the materials that you have to use today, which has been around for the last 50 years, is bismuth telluride. No one recognizes it. And, and, and the performance is so low that it has not been cost effective. So there is a magical number called ZT. I won't go into the details of that. It has um, some material properties. And the ZT is one, which means that you get about 10% or 20% of the limit, 20% of, of, of Carnot limit. Carnot is the, the maximum that you can get out of. And you have to increase ZT higher than two to make it cost effective. And if you look at the amount of abundance of materials, you know, these are the abundance of materials that are around. Silicon, oxygen, aluminum, iron, etc. There's not enough tellurium in the world to do all that. Okay? And it is at $100 a pound today, especially because of the photovoltaics, this cattail photovoltaics, etc. So you have to now look at it and say that things have to dramatically change to make it cost effective. How do you do that? So, um, oops. So this is the history of ZT. Bismuth telluride got discovered in 1955, and the ZT has remained one. And it has not changed for the last 50 years. That's where, you know, sort of university research has to come in and say, can we take this and change it dramatically? Because people, for the last 50 years, have been, have been taking a shot at this. And the reason being, I won't go into the details of the science, there are some fundamental reasons because the properties that are in it, electrical conductivity, Seebeck coefficient, thermal conductivity, are all interrelated. If you change one, everything else changes, and you could not, people have not been able to increase ZT by a factor of you know, 20% over the last uh, 50 years. It's a very hard challenge. Um, and you know, if you look at what people have done recently, there's some nanostructures that have been built, but they're all using telluride material. And as I said, there's not enough tellurium out there. So what do we do? Can we make silicon into something which is useful? 
So people have, been, people have given up on silicon. I won't go into the details of the science again. Silicon has a ZT of a whopping 0 0.008, bulk silicon. It is absolutely, people ignored it. You just throw it out because silicon in bulk form, single crystal or even polycrystalline form is not effective. It's not gonna, the efficiency is just too low and the cost effectiveness is not enough. So what we, we looked at that and said, okay, let's, can we make silicon into a material which can go to ZT of two? That's the challenge. And indeed, we had a discovery uh, recently, and this is a paper in Nature that came out uh, this year, that if you take a, 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 you know, a crystal of silicon and just dip it, um, a wafer of silicon, dip it into a solution, and this is where my chemistry colleague, Pei Dong Yang, is magical, and you get, you get these wires, forest of wires, which are a little bit rough, and it turns out the thermal conductivity of the silicon goes down by a factor of 100, and magically, ZT becomes one, or actually higher than one. And now we have a material, we have the 100 plus billion dollar industry, which can get into a wasted recovery and air conditioning refrigeration, which is, as I told you, is a huge part of our energy equation. So how does it work? Why does it go? We still don't know. And there are some signs to be done out here. We have, so this is, we reached what is called the amorphous limit of thermal conductivity. And we thought that was the end. And this is some data from yesterday. And we have actually beaten that limit now by a factor of two. And it turns out that if you look at the conductance, again, I won't go into the science of this, you are, we are what is called the quantum limit. And we don't know why yet. We have some hypothesis of why this is the, we're approaching quantum limit at room temperature. And can we get to ZTF2? I'm optimistic. It's possible. In silicon. So of course there's a lot of manufacturing that needs to be done, et cetera. But I think there's a fundamental step that we have taken in changing the way things are done and possibly doing things in silicon where the industry, the man, we have started talking to TSMC to see what would be the manufacturing cost of, of devices such as this. Um, if, since we do it in silicon, in terms of just the dollars per watt, today's technology, it'll be around you know, like four or five dollars per watt. We can bring it down below a dollar per watt if it is silicon. So I have a student now extremely excited about starting a company, and he's doing all the sort of calculations on this. Um, let me just, so this is the lab that it was done. These are the students. And that lab, by the way, we call it the Nano Energy Lab, if you can read it carefully, is dedicated to Dean Richard Newton because he got us started with this uh, about a few years ago and uh, along with some financial help from funding from DOE. But this was Dean Richard Newton played a huge role in how we do our research today. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, let me just leave you. This is technology, of course. We're talking about the United States and 100 quads, et cetera, 60 quads, if you can convert that. Let me talk a little bit globally and just to sort of follow up on some of the comments that were made earlier. I just want to show you some pictures. Um, this is the population density of the world. We are in that corner over there, and you know, it's, it's sort of dark. Darker, the higher the population density. And of course, you know where the population densities are the highest. Uh, it's in India, China, Asia, et cetera. And now, let me show you the energy use by lighting pattern. And you find that you know, the United States is really bright, of course, but there are parts of the world where the population density is high, but the lights have not been turned on. And if you overlay that, the two of them, you will then see the mismatch. There are many, many parts of the world where the lights have not been turned on. And if they start turning on the lights like we have, we have a real issue out here. And I think one of the, some of the comments that you made are, are relevant for even for sort of looking at uh, globally. So one thing that we have to understand is that um, what we have to sort of appreciate is that if we have to take the grid to all those parts of the world, that's one approach. The other is something that can we generate electricity locally in some way and let people generate their own electricity and possibly store it and then use it so that we don't have to take the grid. That's the other option. 
I don't know which one will win. But uh, just to keep in mind, um, one of the innovations that has happened here in Berkeley is what is called the Darfur stove. And it has, I think, really impacted people's lives because it saves people's lives. People, women don't have to go out and get wood and, uh, for burning because it is much more efficient. It is a huge societal issue. And one of the things, the inventors of that is a colleague of mine, Ashok Godgill. His office is right next door. And we are now thinking, can we take this device of ours, which generates heat to electricity, and integrate this into the Darfur stove? Because if it is, this stove is not just for Darfur, but many parts of the world that have been sort of untouched by electrification. So let me just leave you with that. And I just uh, one comment of uh, Richard Newton. Uh, besides being the team, uh, uh, dean of engineering, um, he was, of course, one of the most inspirational and uh, persons that I've come across. Also, uh, you know, uh, very polite when you speak to him. The only time I've heard him trash talk is in a game of cricket. And we used to do that every weekend, almost every weekend, when we used to play and have lots of fond memories. Unfortunately, no pictures of that. Lots of fond memories of, um, of Aussie versus Indian cricket. <laughs> Let me just leave you with that. Thank you very much. Maybe give us an idea how far we are away from a practical device or even a prototype. I knew that question was going to come up. Um, that, it, it's a hard question f for, to answer because um, there are lots of issues that have to be sorted out. There's a manufacturing aspect. We're starting to talk to uh, TSMC and other big manufacturers of silicon. Um, there's packaging issues. And there's, of course, the markets issues of how, what kind of business model would you choose to put it out there in the market? Um, I don't know the answers to all of them, but I would suspect that if, you know, if five years is optimistic, uh, probably a little longer term. Um, so let me just leave it at that, and I, I can elaborate if necessary. Maybe give us a little more idea of what this device would look like, how it would be um, integrated into, say, a power plant or other heat generation. Yeah, so if you look at a power plant, a lot of the energy goes into um, if you have a power plant next to a river, for example, or um, the ocean, you have a water being as a coolant and, or evaporator, you know, these large cooling towers. Um, essentially, that, that, that the energy that is carried out there will be in a heat exchanger of some sort. And um, you will have a heat exchanger on the hot side, a heat exchanger on the cold side. That technology exists. What is missing is what is in between them on the hot and the cold. And that's where the, this device will go in. So it'll probably look like a, like a fuel cell with, with, with stacks on it, um, with heat exchanges coming from both sides. And would power plants be the first likely application? Um, it's not clear um, whether it's power plants or whether it is automobiles. There's actually BMW and many of the car companies have in the sort of cars are getting electrified. And we saw one extreme of that. Um, you know, in between, there's, uh, you could take the engines of today uh, and produce electricity because 70% of the energy is wasted in heat. So uh, BMW and many other companies have programs right now to take the heat that is uh, through the tailpipe or the radiator and convert converting that to electricity and charging your batteries. It just makes the car more, much more efficient. Thoughts on this technology, how you get it to commercialization? I think that uh, Arun has touched on a very important point that also relates to the car issues. Uh, uh, the local generation of power, uh, and so is that effective? Can that be considered as being a serious alternative to a global grid, if you like? And also related to the cars, you can generate electricity, as you pointed out, in the car itself. And so uh, there is also an interesting point about how much energy you can create in the car. Uh, to sustain the car itself. So you don't need to, to plug into the grid or any of that. So you have a self-sustaining car. Now, related also to the recovery of energy, there is one important point that uh, 
uh, is a recovery from braking. I mean, braking is a huge uh, waste of energy. So if you take, for example, I, I, I did a little experiment, but if you take a Ferrari and you corner it, right, and you brake, you know how much uh, power that generates? One megawatt, right, of power. Remember power, so it's, it's a very short time. Uh, so energy is not that much. But recuperating that kind of, uh, of energy that is wasted is a huge potential. And so I think that uh, uh, recirculating energy and uh, localizing the creation of energy is probably a, a, a good alternative that we should look at versus this mega project of having mega grids and mega stuff. I would say also some of the ways that besides power plant and automobiles, um, we have been chatting with a lot of uh, companies that make, for example, glass manufacturing, um, uh, steel manufacturing, or glass manufacturing, paper manufacturing on a smaller scale. I was talking to a plant manager in Texas. Um, six megawatts of heat being lost at about 450 degrees Celsius. And if you just do the math of that in terms of you know, price of electricity, it's a huge number. You know, that's just one plant, and if you now multiply, that's the norm today. And um, they're asking us to see, can you put a pilot plant out here, and can we take the electricity and sell it and give it to homes? So that's something that, you know, in, there's an opportunity out there. I don't know which is the, the go-to market. I don't know that yet. Yeah. I asked you guys. I have actually a question here. I mean, if you look at it from a holistic point of view, um, you can indeed uh, recuperate some energy that you're wasting, but uh, the energy that you need to spend to create uh, the device that allows you to do that, when is, where is the break even? Do you, you know, do you have any insights on that? Sorry, the energy that you need to make this yeah. thing? Um, I haven't done the calculation yet. Uh, in terms of uh, what is the, you know, whether it's, you know, one year or, or I, I guess that's the break even that you're looking at. What's the payback time? The payback time the, in the data is there. It's, uh, I think, a couple of years. But I'm not sure whether it's a whole life cycle cost or not. Um, this is usual in a semiconductor manufacturing that is going on today using that, those prices. But in terms of the energy that is, goes into making the silicon itself, um, to be honest, I haven't done the calculation. So one interesting application for this could be uh, it's a very fast growing area is the uh, data centers, compute centers and things like that, where you really have that heat problem today and where energy cost has become one of the most dominant factors. Actually, the whole cost of the data center is about, uh, in about three years, the cost of energy is going to override every other cost. And this is, uh, they're struggling with this. So what to do with the heat which is generated by these massive racks of computers and how to get it out there. So actually an effective way of turning that and creating more efficiency would be a very interesting area to look at. And people are investing in it today. Um, one, one comment I yeah. uh, Go ahead. I, my, my question was you had originally uh, said that 10% of the energy input is what you're looking to recycle back into a, a, um, electric generation. And there's a lot of technology and actually system design approaches in the steel industry and in the glass industry and the data centers to not generate the heat to start or to, to get the temperature differential down. Um, is, so I guess a couple of points. One is I think the 10% goal is a little modest, right? We should. We got to have, um, although the impact is very hard at 10%, the ability to reuse waste heat could, could be a lot bigger um, and maybe not turning it into electricity as a first step. Um, you know, the second question is this technology, you know, in, in terms of the overall energy balance, if you will, how it, it's hard to, for me to gauge what that incremental improvement would be over technologies that are already being used for this. The technologies that are used today are um, the bismuth telluride technology. Um, is that what you were? Yeah, and also system design, right? So, yeah. so the reuse of, of waste, you know, in, in glass factories, you might not have the problem out here, but, you know, in the Northeast or in the middle of America, they right. use the heat to heat their offices and, and, right. and drive the water heating and other things in district heating scenarios. Right. 
So combined heat and power is what is uh, the technology that is used today. And fortunately, it's not widely used. That's why it's being wasted. Um, there is also um, the, the issue of, uh, in terms of what is being done today for electricity generation is bismuth telluride. And it's, it's just not scalable in terms of the, the manufacturing, the efficiency, dollars per watt, et cetera. Uh, but you're absolutely right. You could do a lot of things with the waste heat itself, heating our homes. Um, Unfortunately, the way we are designed our, um, our cities um, and the power generation, often the power generation is much further away from the city. And so they use the waste heat um, in the homes and, um, and, and commercial buildings is very hard. Um, if they're, you know, the coal-fired power plant should be in the city and the solar should be in the desert. Unfortunately, people try to do it the other way around and then we run into problems. But you're right. Yeah. I, I had one question, I guess. Um, while the, the total value of waste heat is, is huge, you know, the upper right hand in the graph there, it seems like what would be really important is to look at the, how that distribution looks as, as a, in terms of what the delta T is. Because yeah. um, I would imagine that a pretty small amount of that is really where you have several hundred degrees that can really drive a really efficient application of that technology. Things like data centers have you know, there, there might be a ton of heat, and it's, it's kind of troublesome to get rid of, but the, the delta in temperature from the hot to the cold source is very low. So, um, you know, this, this ZT relates to percent of Carnot, but Carnot is already very, very small for those kind of temperatures. Yeah, so this, um, you're absolutely right. The delta T, the temperature difference is really the potential of which you can get a fraction of the Carnot. The number of 10% is based on a delta T of 100 degrees Celsius. Um, but often, in data centers is less, but often it is much higher than, that, you know, 100 degrees Celsius, so. Um, so but, but you think a ZT of two is, is cost competitive with 100 degree C, or does it take much more than that? Uh, yes, a ZT of two, I mean, there was a paper in, in Science about a few months ago on what is the, the ZT that you need to make this cost effective, and, you know, it's sort of the, uh, the rule of thumb right now is that if you can get ZT of two, or more, of course, is, is then gets cost effective then with the right system design. All right. Thank you. We'll move on to our last speaker. Tom Siebel is going to talk about the affordable zero energy home. Morning. All righty. Am I going to be able to see what we're doing here? I guess I will. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the, um, the, the challenge that was put before us was to, was to propose a, a, a moonshot type challenge that might result in a flurry of innovation. And so we've given that a little thought. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of um, technology changes that have been driving uh, economic opportunity and opportunities for um, uh, business formation in the last couple of decades. And if we kind of, um, and so I'm going to talk about this in the context of IT to ET. And if we look at the, like the last 20 years, at the big picture of the last 20 years, I think we had an environment that was characterized by the availability of cheap energy, very, very favorable government policies, which fueled concepts like, you know, taking risk and, you know, broad-based employee equity ownership, things like this. Uh, very, we had an efficient capital market system with a free flow of capital to innovation. And this play, took place in the context of an information revolution, this switch to the post-industrial society, which was no small economic event. And if we look at this, resulted in the development of information technology industry from 1975 to, say, 2000, that grew at a 17% compound annual growth rate, going from zero to roughly a $3 trillion global business. And for those of us, those of you who participated, it was a wild ride. Okay, now a lot of this was driven, you know, honestly, this was driven by defense technology. It was driven by the space race. And I know that, you know, a lot of my friends up and down Sand Hill Road want to take credit for this. 
but it just didn't happen there. Okay, and, and these are all these are all basically, uh, um, you know, secondary and tertiary effects of uh, developments and advancement in miniaturiz miniaturization and transistor technology. And you know, I think a lot of that was driven by, by um, defense, ARPANET, the space race. And so we saw over the last couple of decades, as we as once we found that, the, the, that we figured out that these computers could be useful for something. Okay, so it took a while to get there, and then as this, as as we grew from, you know, we went through this transition from a fundamentally industrial economy to a post-industrial economy, where where you know the the assets of greatest scarcity and value switched from physical assets to physical to non-physical assets. Um, those of us who participated in this market saw these new generations of technology that basically required the entire installed base to be replaced as we move from mainframes to mini computers to the network, uh, the personal computer, relational database technology, application software, the internet. And I would argue that that vision has been achieved. And much of what, and the, and the result of that was the formation of some pretty substantial companies. Some of the world's great companies uh, were, uh, came out of this initiative. Now, I'd argue also that this market that grew at a 17% compound annual growth rate from 1975 to 2000 is basically now growing at the rate of the growth of the economy, which doesn't look to be <coughs> real um, uh, robust in the next few years. And if we look at, you know, for example, what the venture markets have been investing in, you know, this was the investment in information technology going into 2000. From 2000 to 2007, it's been decreasing at a rate of approximately 1% a year. Okay, now, big picture 2010 to 2030, what do we see? What's it look like? What are the, you know, with the last 20 years, I mean, we've seen a number of significant global events that fueled innovation, transportation in the mid-1800s, urban electrification in the early part of the last century, uh, transport, uh, World War II, uh, transportation after that, automotives, interstate highway system, information technology, what's going on now? Well, you know, the big picture we see increasing government regulation, I think free markets are kind of an idea that, kind of a passe, that's an idea that's for old guys like me. Uh, uh, exponential population growth, aging population, growing healthcare market, energy scarcity. Let's look at that. So if the, if the graph that started every slide presentation for the last 20 years was Moore's Law, okay, you all had it in your deck, I think the graph in the next 20 years looks like this. It, it starts with a look at global population growth. So Homo sapiens have been on the planet for roughly 100,000 years, right? And it took till 1750 to get a billion of them on the planet. So this is where you are as of about 1750. You've gone from, you know, a couple of people walking around the woods to however that happened or the jungle to a billion people in 1750. Today there's six and a half billion, okay? Going to nine. This is a pretty significant chart. And I think the consequences of this are, 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 are I mean, so all this stuff that we used to read about in the 60s and who was it, Paul Ehrlichman and all these kind of end of the world stories that people used to talk about the population bomb, we are here. Uh, and, and I would suggest that a lot of the market opportunities that we're going to see in the next few decades are related to this phenomenon. And they're not, I mean, I don't think it's plastics. Right? I mean, it's, it's a little bit more fundamental. It's food, it's water, it's energy, it's health care. And addressing this phenomenon. Okay, so here's the, so let's talk about energy. So here is the real deal, not projected, I mean, gonna happen in real time, in our lifetime, okay, happening right now, energy growth numbers. Overlay this on per capita energy usage over the same time frame, from, you know, burning dung at a fire, to using animals for agriculture, to industrialization, to the era of the Nintendo. 
So this is kind of what it looks like. Now, when you overlay those two graphs upon one another, it becomes pretty significant, resulting in, I think, a number similar to what Arun presented um, uh, in 1980. We're using something like 400 quads of energy uh, globally, basically doubling in not very many years. How is this energy being utilized? Well, in the United States, we're using about 40% of it for buildings. Okay, buildings are the single largest consumers of energy. And so this is about 2003 dollars. What do we spend on energy? We spend about $400 billion. And 40% um, uh, of that is used for buildings. And that results in about 60% of the particulate that goes into the atmosphere. Where does it come from? It comes from hydrocarbons, period. Okay, 86% of it comes from hydrocarbons. Now, Al Gore aside, you look at virtually every projection of energy usage going forward into the next, you know, say 50 years, and where does it come from? It's coming from hydrocarbons. And uh, there's a gentleman over at Stanford by the name of Aldo De Rosa, who uh, does give you know, a lot of thought to this. And you know, he explained to me at lunch, he said, Tom, if we had the silver bullet today to solve this, it would take 30 years to work itself into the, you know, to have a meaningful impact just due to the, you know, the inertia of the infrastructure issues. OK, and so you couple that with things like climate change, peak energy, and it, you know, some of the problems are kind of interesting. Well, uh, so there's a number of approaches to this. One is, you know, drill, drill, drill. And we're going to, so this is our, this is our moonshot now. This is the challenge that we're, this, we're coming up with the idea of invent, 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 as it relates to solving, addressing a small aspect of this problem. And we're going to focus on a, a, a challenge, a global challenge, that might make a contribution to the dialogue and energy on the scale of the house. And so there is a rich history of challenges, of technology challenges, making significant contributions. Um, you know, whether, you know, Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic to win, you know, a $25,000 prize. Lots of other people tried before him and failed. Uh, the, in the 1700s, the British Parliament held, a, held a, uh, a contest for a device that would assist in navigation, in determining longitude, and somebody invented the chronograph in response to that. They didn't pay the guy. He went bankrupt. They stiffed him. Uh, uh, so there's been lots of examples over time where challenges and, and, and prizes have fueled innovation. And so we're proposing the idea of a prize, a global challenge, with significant uh, awards out there to fuel the innovation of the energy-free home. And, wh and what's the energy-free home? The energy-free home is a home that can be grid-connected but at the end of 365 days, the meter reads zero. So to the extent that you use, in, uh, use energy off the grid, you have, to get, you have to put it back. And if you use, it's kind of a virtual zero. So if you use natural gas or some other substance, you have to pay that back into the grid too. Uh, secondly, the zero energy home that we're defining is one that is, is, has no trade-off in utility. Is built, say, to US standards, 2,000 square feet, three bedroom, two bath, but you can't solve the problem by sitting in the dark and freezing to death. The third aspect of the, um, and by the way, that's not very hard. Okay, you can do that. And people build ho homes in, in the United States that meet those criteria, thank you, uh, all, all the time. What's hard is, to do it where the cost of construction is no greater than the cost of conventional construction. Okay, now if you, if you do some work on thinking about this, here you need to, in, it gets, this is really, really, really hard. This is not possible with today's technologies. So somebody needs to invent the transistor of this problem, the operating system. I mean, there needs to be new systems, operating systems, devices, uh, energy conservation technologies, design technologies, energy, energy generation technologies, storage technologies. A lot of serious work needs to be done to achieve this objective. And so we're pro proposing the idea of a large-scale global challenge, which maybe with maybe, say, $20 million in prize money, 
to see if we could feel the, the thought is, could that, would, might that, could that, would that fuel some innovation around the world? And perhaps the first phase is the invent phase, where you encourage teams at United Technologies or GE Power or KB Holmes or Tsinghua University, University of Illinois, Stanford, whatever, to, devet, to come up to invent things, devices, systems, technologies, design techniques that might have a meaningful impact on reducing the energy footprint of that home, net energy footprint. Okay? And, then, and, and say you have five or $10 million in prizes associated with that, and you take these technologies and you publicize them in a big way. You have, you know, they're featured on internet websites and TV shows, and you feature them at the Shanghai World's Fair in 2010. And then the second phase of this, you know, for just thinking in real time here, and then the, the second phase of this idea is you um, <clears throat> have a design build phase where you challenge architects and engineers and builders to take these technologies and other technologies that might be available to come up with designs for homes that meet the criteria. Zero energy footprint, no trade off in utility by US standards, cost of construction no greater than the cost of conventional construction. And you take those designs, you evaluate them, you pick, you give maybe awards, maybe you give a half million dollar awards to 10 of them, and then you build those houses. Okay, you, you test them empirically for a year or two, and you take the best of those and then build the first energy-free community. And maybe you take an energy-free community and you build a 100 home energy-free community, maybe you build it on the campus of Princeton University or University of Illinois or someplace. It becomes a historic event. If you could build a 100-home energy-free community in a time frame, in a, in a 2012, 2013, 2014 time frame that with homes that met these characteristics, I would argue that the world would never be the same. How long might it take to accomplish? Well, you know, I think it would take, you know, two, three years through the technology phase and another, you know, two, three, four years through the design-build phase. I think that, that's kind of the time frame. What's the opportunity? Okay, if you, I mean, if you could build it, let's say, so now you have an energy-free home community or energy-free community, and you build three of them. Perhaps you build one in California, you build one in the Midwest, you build one in the East, one in the Southwest, I realize I got to more than three. But, you know, you get this to work. I mean, what's, what's the opportunity? If you could get 40% penetration out of these technologies in, in, inside uh, 15 years in the United States, According to our friends at McKinsey and Company, it would reduce CO2 penetra uh, emissions by 191 million metric tons in the U.S. alone. That's, that's uh, roughly equivalent to removing 36 million cars from the road. So that's, our, that's the thought, uh, to uh, see if we could rather than, you know, this is not proposed as a large government uh, event or a public policy event. It's a, it's a private sector event to see if we can fuel a great deal of innovation around the planet to make a significant contribution to the dialogue. Uh, what happens? So <clears throat> what's failure look like? Well, maybe you can't get, maybe, maybe the energy, maybe you can't get there. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe you can't get there in this time frame, but what's the probability that somebody doesn't come, and come up with something significant trying to chase a $10 million carrot that makes a, that makes a contribution to the dialogue and a significant contribution? I would, I would argue that the probability of that not happening approaches zero. Thank you very much. Tom. Let me ask, if you build it, will they come? Will the consumers come? Will the home building industry replicate this? Or do you really need at some point, if you prove your thesis, have some kind of government regulation or requirement that this is the energy efficiency standards for a residential home? If there are two homes of identical utility and identical, and identical appeal identical, with identical uh, you know, number of bedrooms and sinks and showers, and, and they cost the same amount of money, and the only difference is with one that you should build with the utility build is zero, and the other is non-zero. I mean, I think zero looks like 
<laughs> Looks like a better, you know, yeah. um, I would suggest that a rational consumer will go for zero. Tom, I have a question um, and in terms of the metrics. Um, Obviously, today it's possible to build a zero. Energy Absolutely, home. a bunch of people do it. This is the cost issue, and exactly right. That so that's the question: is what is the cost ratio? Do you think today, what's the reduction in cost that we need to get to get to your point? I think it take it take as far as we can see. First of all, most of the energy-free homes that are being built are like seventy-five hundred square feet in Portola Valley, and they cost about you know a thousand dollars a square foot. Okay, and you know they have, these, they have these PV arrays where the payback is you know infinite. Uh, the, uh, so it, but it can be done. Uh, but as far as we can see, it's going to require, if, if you take the kind of best practices home coming out of like DOE today, it's going to take about a 25% to 30% cost reduction, you know, in terms of the equation to get there. A slightly different uh, response, and uh, because I'm thinking back to uh, Rich Newton and, and uh, the fact that he's floating around here somewhere listening to this with a smile on his face, uh, especially big ideas like this. So about a month before his illness set in, I had the pleasure, uh, because I'm Icklack's uh, counterpart at Stanford and teach entrepreneurship and engineering school, like Icklack does here at Berkeley, and so I had the pleasure, though, of interviewing Rich Newton along with uh, my dean of engineering, Jim Plummer, and they were very close friends, and we talked about uh, getting young people fired up. And so these are the kind of ideas that do. I mean, uh, changing the way we build homes, changing the way we fuel our cars. Um, there's no rivalry. There was a rivalry 48 hours from now right next door that will take place uh, in sport, but there's there's no rivalry uh, when it comes to this between these two institutions and, frankly, the, our, our peers around the world. But these are the big ideas that are, are going to uh, fire up this next generation of students. And th that is why they take the entrepreneurship and uh, innovation courses that we, we offer now, thanks to the Kauffman Foundation and other supporters. Uh, I had to slip that in, of course. Um, but it, it was a vision of, uh, of Rich to, to have a March Madness equivalent you know, like we see in sports. Um, and, th you know, these are candidates for that. And so when I, I'm listening to this, this is very easy to translate back to this uh, next generation of students. So that's a, that's a comment. And, and it's not a policy, you know, issue. It's, uh, it's something's real. It takes, doesn't take a lot of investment because it's a, it's a power of ideas. The idea of the X, oops. Thanks, great. I also think the idea of an X Prize kind of approach is great, and I've been involved in some of the efforts to come up with X Prize structures in healthcare, and we're actually working on the idea of how you could build housing that would reduce healthcare costs to near zero, which I think we have a lot of the elements, and I'll look forward to what Reg and others talk about for that. But I wondered, given the enormous amount of old stock in housing everywhere now, what about the idea, or did you think about the idea of the potential for renovation of old stock? Because if you could reduce the energy costs of old stock by even 50 to 60 percent, that would, might make an even greater contribution in a 20-year time frame than what would be stimulated by this. I'm not an expert at this, but as I understand energy utilization in these homes, there's lots of different aspects, lighting, heating, appliances are big. And so I think that, you know, many, many of these technologies would apply to, you know, glazing would reply, would, would apply to the retrofit marketplace. And so that is clearly would be, that would, if this, something like this were to be done, that would clearly need to be part of the vision. Uh, uh, one thing that I potentially would would like to add to this, perhaps there is also a phase before this, uh, it relates a little bit to the previous remarks also made, that this, you know, making sure that people are well informed about where the energy is going. I think we all, you know, if we want to reduce the energy today, we all get our PG&E bill, and we are sometimes surprised and sometimes not, and but we have no idea actually what are the, at the micro uh, level, what are the issues that are contributing to that. And sometimes people are uh, acting upon what they are measured upon. And, and so if you could also kind of change some of that uh, into the homes today, uh, that could have more immediate impact potentially. I'd be amazed if that wasn't part of a solution with kind of a Prius-like human interface 
that let people, that, you know, that provides people uh, transparency in the price transparency into what's going on in the house. So they have no, they have no transparency there, just like they have no, tra there's no price transparency in the healthcare system. Same, really, the same problem. It's a black box, and you get a bill. It's rolling out an interface in homes that gives you a um, minute by minute cost of the electricity you consume and where it's coming from. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, actually the idea of a prize is a great idea because these reference installations are what's required in order to be able to kind of understand what the impact is. The, the one thing about the, both the residential and commercial construction markets are there, the diffusion of technology is, is a huge challenge, right? You have less stakeholders in residential than in commercial construction, but between the, the equipment suppliers, the architects, the builders that rely on subcontractors for subsystems, to actually get the technology, um, any new novel new technology for any one of the systems is really hard. And so I really believe that this idea of build the complete house um, is the only way. And then you have a huge education problem in actually how to get that done. So one of the major issues in the 7,000 square foot houses that are built zero energy is if you try and buy a smaller house, you can't find people to engineer solutions for the three bedroom, uh, two bath house today. So it's a, it's a really good way to approach the problem. I would say also that uh, probably to get to the zero energy home, we have to look at the commercial side first because the commercial side, you can get much, much more um, benefits. And, and, and also if you think about hotels and things of that sort, there is a huge, uh, waste of energy and uh, the engineering aspect is never taken as a system. So it's, it's broken out in, in different subsystems that are not designed coherently and uh, there are lots of low hanging fruit in the commercial side which could be then used to drive the, the home domain and in terms of the, of the uh, uh, chain that you, the value chain that you indicate in the commercial bin is very clear what's going on and how you, you should support, for example, the building managers with better tools and so on to, to manage the energy intake and the energy usage. The, the, only, the only point on, so we work a uh, similar type of project in the commercial side. The problem is the stakeholders are a lot more diverse. I mean, the homeowner can, can invest the money and get the return and, you know, how that works through a developer, an architect, an engineering firm, and it, particularly in the United States, is a pretty pretty difficult thing. Right now, the technologies that we are, it's about a 30% delta um, to do something at the highest level of green or sustainable design right now to a, to a normal building and this is something that's coming down uh, but in a home it's it's quite a quite a lot bigger uh, gap well one thing that was going through my mind you know thinking of you know how you break this down is there's two aspects one is you know how much do you try and generate um, at the house and the other is how much do you try and invest in efficiency to you know offset the need to generate and you know what the percentage breakdown there I don't think is very intuitive you know is it do you want to reduce usage by 90% and then generate 10, or do you want to generate 90 and reduce it by 10? And that breakdown, I think, is a really interesting thing to, to try and think about and study. The other piece is I, my, my intuition is that it's probably more like save 70 or 80 and generate you know, 20. Um, and with the majority of that being in efficiency or savings in usage, you know, how, do we, how do we incentivize or, or make kind of sexy the idea of improving efficiency? Because that's usually the one that goes to the back of the bus, gets forgotten about, and um, it doesn't sort of get people revved up and get you know, students or, or other you know, entrepreneurs really excited about implementing. Um, so I think trying to architect some kind of challenge or, or prize around just you know, reducing, you know, improving efficiency or finding some metric there would be, would be great. Even looking at the light bulbs in this room, I mean, these are you know, sort of the worst technology light bulbs. And we're sitting in a room you know, discussing energy efficiency under a, a sea of uh, incandescent lights. Uh, Tom, Tom, I wonder if you've talked to um, commercial real estate developers and found out from them what they consider the major hurdles that they have, to, they need us to overcome before they will incorporate these technologies just in, just on the commercial market. You mean the builders? Yeah, the builders uh, talking to them today is um, is like talking to a CEO of a builder is like talking to a CEO of a of an auto company in Detroit. Okay, <laughs> I mean they're about you know, this far from hanging themselves in the shower, just trying to figure out how to sell something. And, I mean, they're, they're in panic. But we have, we have been talking with them, and actually quite a bit. 
speakers and the panelists. Okay. Um, just we're, we're going to take a break right now, but I just want to remind you that while it's still fresh in your mind, this would be a very good time to fill out the three numbers that we need from you. Um, again, how many years and then rate it on a societal benefit and a uh, scale of how much industry could be created. If, if you look at it, it's, it's fairly well um, explained. But we're saying on the size of industry, um, a five means it's like creating a whole new Silicon Valley. And one is like starting one single new venture. So we're trying to get an idea how big you think these things are. 